Hi, well, today's great discovery um, might not seem like a great discovery in one sense. There's not lots of gold and silver and buried tombs or anything like that. But the, I'm really going to talk about two great discoveries, and that's the discovery of the Iron Age site at Holstadt and then the Iron Age site at Latain. Uh, the reason I decided to do these two topics was uh, basically to help you understand how archaeological ideas and theory uh, were developing at this particular time in the early 19th century. Well, what about Holstadt? Uh, I couldn't find a map with Holstadt on it, so I had to take this old archaeological map. Uh, I'll try and get you a Google version before I put it um, uh, on Moodle. Uh, Holstadt is a, a small village uh, over there in Austria and until 1875 it was one of the most isolated villages in this part of Europe. Until 1875 the only way of getting to Holstadt was by going across a very large lake, very nice and pleasant in the summer, not so pleasant in the winter time, but Holstadt was although it was very isolated, was one of the most important villages in this uh, part of Europe from a very early time right down into the early 19th century. And this is simply because the mountains behind Hallstatt contain large quantities of natural rock salt. Well, today we don't tend to realise the importance of salt except in the uh, sense of flavouring food. But until the development of modern refrigeration methods, salt was the only way that you could preserve meat, fish and vegetables throughout the, um, the winter months, throughout the whole year. Well, if you live by the sea, of course, you can get natural sea salt. But if you lived in Central Europe, the area around uh, Holstadt, uh, some one and a half thousand kilometers from the nearest uh, supply of sea salt, then you had to mine it. And Holstadt, the mountains, were absolutely full of salt. Well, you will recognize at least two of these things here. The one at the end, I don't know if you have salted fish in Turkey or not. But anyway, you, the point being that salt was used for preserving people. Salt, until the late 19th century was often referred to as white gold because it was so incredibly valuable. And anybody who could control a supply of salt naturally made a great deal of money from this. Well, the white gold industry at Holstadt, we now know, goes back for thousands of years. But in the 19th century, all that people knew, really knew was that, uh, yes, it had, had existed from at least medieval times when the modern village of Holstadt was established. Before then, not much was known about the history of that area. But what we find happening in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, as the, the big cities of Europe began to develop, populations grow, you start to get cities with populations of 10 to 20,000, which doesn't sound very large, but which was enormously large at this time, then the demand for salt increases. And the people at Holstadt were literally sitting on a white gold mine. And so during the 17th and early 18th century, more and more salt mines began to be open at Holstadt itself. In the process, people would frequently find evidence of much older salt workings. Narrow tunnels like this, they couldn't put a date to them, but inside these tunnels they would find pieces of pottery, animal bones, the remains of lamps, even preserved baskets. Salt is a preservative, so the baskets were preserved quite well. And on one occasion, I think 1753, they even found the body of a salt miner who died there. His body was perfectly preserved, thanks to dying in a salt mine. So they picked him up and they buried him in the local churchyard, not having any idea uh, what date he might belong to, but knowing that he must have died in a much earlier accident. Well, as the number of salt mines increased at Holstadt, as the populations of the cities in Europe got larger and larger, the mining of salt at Holstadt became a state industry. And between about 1800 and 1815, people started to 
dig for salt by the side of a large field that lay in a valley just above the village of Holstadt. They started to find burials. Graves containing objects of bronze and iron, simple pottery vases. Well, they didn't really know what these were, but they thought they'd better collect them, and so the local miners got together a collection and sent them to the nearby museum at Linz. They arrived at Linz, and they were put in a storeroom, and everybody forgot about them. More and more salt mines continued to be open, and round about 1825, 1831, we hear of a series of excavations around the entrance to one of these salt mines in this same field area. And again, they find more burials, they find skeletons. When you bury somebody complete with their body, we call it an inhumation. But they also found the remains of burnt bones in some graves. Well, they didn't recognize these for what they were. They were cremation burials. Well, cremation burial is something that's very popular in most parts of Europe today. But until very recently, in fact, only uh, as recently as 1910, cremation burial was illegal throughout most of Europe. So people really didn't recognize that these groups of burnt bones represented ancient burials. But they found them with bronze vessels, iron swords, so they knew there had to be some form of uh, burial from a much earlier period. Well, again, the material from this small-scale excavation was gathered together, and it was sent to Linz, and exactly the same thing happened. It arrived there, it was unpacked, it was put in a storeroom, and promptly forgotten about. Outside of Holstadt, Nobody knew about these strange burials that were being found there. Cremation burials, inhumation burials, with bronze objects, iron objects. People in Holstadt didn't really know about the idea of the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. It's the 1830s. Thompson is still working on his uh, three-age typology at this particular time. But then, in 1846, it was decided to build a road from the Holstadt village up into the mountains to make access to the salt mines that much easier. And the person who was chosen to do this job was a local person, Johann Ramsauer. Well, Johann Ramsauer, an engineer with the State Mining Company, born in Holstadt, growing up in Holstadt, he knew about all the graves that had been found there. He had to get some suitable road building material, gravel. He knew that in the field where the burials had been found there was gravel, so he decided to get his gravel from there. He knew he would probably find burials. And sure enough, the very first day they were, his workmen were uh, digging the gravel up, they found an inhumation burial with a single bronze earring. The next day they found two more burials. The day after that, they found five more burials. Well, Ramsauer was a, a very conscientious worker. He knew he'd better not do anything that might upset his bosses. He didn't know quite what to do with what he was finding, though. But he decided, be on the safe side, make a very careful record of everything I've found, and I will send it to my bosses in Vienna and I'll let them decide what to do with it. And so two large boxes of assorted bones, bits of pottery, bronze objects, iron objects, iron swords, bronze swords, arrived in Vienna, where, of course, the state mining industry didn't quite know what to do with it either. So they decided to give it to this man, Eduard Baron von Sachen. Baron von Sachen was in charge of the imperial collections of coins and other antiquities. And the moment he saw these objects, he recognized them for what they were. Objects of Bronze Age date and of Iron Age date. So he immediately contacted Ramsauer, promised Ramsauer money, and said you must make a proper record of everything you find from now on, and I will arrange for you to keep on working at this site for as long as it takes. Not only did von Sacken realize that these were objects of bronze and iron age date, 
he also saw that none of the objects were Roman. Well, the Romans had arrived in this part of uh, Europe around about 15 BC. So he already had an idea that the site must be earlier than the 15 BC. He realized that as bronze swords had been found there, and iron swords as well, then this, must, this graveyard, this cemetery field, must represent a time of transition between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. He knew enough about Thompson's three-age system to realize the importance of this. For the first time, you had a single site where you didn't have Iron Age on top of Bronze Age, but people who coexisted lived at the same time. When bronze was gradually being replaced as the, weapon, as the metal for weapons and tools um, by iron. The other thing was, Vienna didn't have that many wonderful prehistoric antiquities. As I said about Layard, the early 19th century was the, really a period when museums all over Europe were trying to make the best collections they could of antiquities. It was a matter of national prestige. As you'll find out in a future class, the Louvre in, in Paris couldn't get any antiquities, they didn't think, so they decided to collect early Christian books. The British Museum was collecting what it could from everywhere in the Ottoman Empire. In Copenhagen, you had the National Museum of Northern Antiquities, Thompson in charge of it. Wonderful Bronze Age, Iron Age and Stone Age collections. Vienna did not have anything, so von Sacken decided that this was the opportunity to make Vienna the home of an international museum. So Ramsauer was told to keep on digging there. Ramsauer was sent money, he was sent a group of artists to start working on the site. This is 1846, 1847. And that began an 18-year program of excavation for several weeks each year, usually sort of towards the uh, autumn time. Ramsauer and von Sacken probably had no idea at this time that what they were beginning was the longest and most carefully recorded excavation of its actual period. Well, Ramsauer starts digging up the graves. He's given an artist they have no photography in this time. He makes these incredibly detailed drawings, watercolour paintings actually, of all the different graves he found. These are the most accurate records that we have of this time of any excavation. They're far better than anything that Layard was doing or anybody else. And over the next 18 years, he excavated a total of 993 graves. 525 of them were inhumation burials like this. Uh, another 445 were cremation burials. The body had been burnt, usually placed inside a wooden box, which had decayed, of course, but you could still see the remains of the box. And another 13 or so, which were incomplete cremation burials. Well, this is just one of the pages from his uh, records, and you can see how incredibly detailed these records are. So that for each grave he would carefully record the position of the skeleton, the way the skeleton was lying, what was found in the grave. So example, for example in this one you have a, the skeleton of a horse as well. Uh, you also have a large number of pots there. This shows you a section through one of the graves revealing that they were not that far beneath the surface. Some of them were only 50 centimetres below the surface of the soil. He also realised that in some cases he had multiple burials, in which there would be an initial burial like this and then other skeletons placed on top. Sometimes he had what he thought were family groups. One large skeleton, slightly smaller adult skeleton, and two other skeletons as well. This is the kind of detail that he was recording. Things like a bronze belt, we now know it's a bronze belt, placed at the foot of a skeleton. Bronze brooches on the breast of the skeleton indicating the person had been buried wearing clothing. Here we have a female skeleton 
with a beautiful row of bronze pins. She must have had a very elaborate hairstyle when she was buried. In some cases, he records that the burial had a rather strange position. He couldn't come up with any explanation for this. This is one of his records of a cremation burial. And you can see the large number of pottery vessels that were placed in there with other bronze objects by the side. Uh, you, the ones in yellow here represent bronze vessels, and you can see them in the section drawer in there as well. So he was making an absolute fantastic record of what he was discovering. Well, 993 graves. As you can imagine, an enormous number of grave goods. Over 6,000 separate grave goods were recorded in those 18 years. They came in a wide variety of materials, a wide variety of types. So, for example, he had some bronze swords in some graves, a lot more iron swords in other graves, iron daggers and bronze daggers. Uh, he would find elaborate bronze jewellery, bronze brooches, simple bronze pins. He would find bronze cooking pots and bronze jugs. He would find simple pottery vessels as well. A wide range of material of all possible types. He realised as he was digging the cemetery that you could broadly classify the graves into two types, apart from inhumation or cremation. And that is that the cremation burials almost always had weapons with them. Most of the inhumation burials did not. So there was a difference that he could see in the type of burial that was taking place. But what was even more important, although he didn't know it at the time, was the type of material he was actually digging up. He would find things like this, a bronze sword, and iron swords, many more iron swords than bronze swords. The iron swords usually decorated with bronze or in one case uh, with ivory. He could see that there were similarities in the style. A bronze sword, the top of the bronze sword, what we call the pommel, is exactly the same style as the pommel you find on the iron swords. Von Sacken realized that what this meant was that you really did have represented in this graveyard people who lived at the same time using the same style of weapon but in different materials. It really was the transition period between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. Well, here are some uh, typical uh, Harstadt Iron Age swords. We call them hat-headed because they do look rather like a hat on the top there. Uh, this is made of bronze, that's made of bronze, the rest is iron. There would have been a wooden handle, but that's gone. And here, a very remarkable find, an iron sword with bronze decoration. And on the top, an ivory pommel. Well, ivory has to come from Africa, or India, most likely Africa in this particular case. A whole range of daggers with, a ven again, a very distinctive type of pommel on them, and several examples of what we call these bronze belts. Lots of different items of jewellery. So you have these brooches like this, very curved brooches. This is a later version of the same type. Simple copper pins or bronze pins like that, a shoulder ornament there, something that must have decorated a blouse of some kind, and a piece of rock salt in the background so you can see what that looks like. The most important finds of all, though, which Ramsauer, no education in archaeology, didn't recognize at the time, but von Sacken certainly did, was that some of the graves contained imported objects. In some places, here we have um, glass bowls from two separate graves. These were glass bowls of a type that had already been found, they were known of, from graves in North Italy. The graves in North Italy could be dated to broadly around the year 400 BC. There were also items like this. Bronze jugs of a North Italian type, which again were known of from graves in North Italy, to date to around about 400 BC. So, what people realised, they had it, Holstadt, 
was a cemetery that started at the end of the Bronze Age, because there were some bronze swords and daggers there, but very few. The bronze swords were in a similar style to the iron swords. But this graveyard, this cemetery, must have continued up to about 400 BC, but no later. There was absolutely nothing in the 6,000 or so objects that dated any later than about 400 BC. Well, you can imagine von Sacken's reaction to 6,000 objects turning up. He wants to establish the museum in Vienna as an international museum. He's got the material to do it. Uh, he was overjoyed by what was just being found. But he was also a rather strange person in a way, in that as more and more visitors came to visit the site, he would start saying, oh, well, I've got two of these bronze jugs. Would you like one as a present? Oh, thank you very much indeed. So of those 6,000 or so items, roughly 3,000 metal items found at Holstadt, there's only roughly 1,000 left in Vienna Museum today. The rest have all gone all around the world. Well, as if that was not bad enough, von Sanken did something which really annoys modern archaeologists. All in all, there were 1,000 separate skeletons and a few and cremations altogether. And he decided to keep only one of the skeletons and a few skulls. And this is the only surviving skeleton from the Holstein graveyard, as extroverted by Ramsauer. Is this important? Well, archaeological methods today, and you'll learn about this in another class, we can analyze people's teeth and say where they are born and where they grow up. It all depends on the water you drink, but I'll tell you about that in another class. We can also, of course, tell the difference between male and female skeletons. We can put an age to skeletons. We can analyze bones and find out what people were eating. Mainly meat, mainly vegetarian, mainly fish. All sorts of information can be recovered from skeletons. Well, one of the things, of course, we would love to know is if most of the cremations had weapons in them, does this mean that these were burials of men or not? Roughly equal numbers of inhumations and cremation. Well, you might naturally think that if you find a burial with weapons in it, it must be a man. But we now know from analysis of other graves, more recently excavated, that for various reasons, women were sometimes buried with weapons. So we've got no idea of the, the sex ratio, the age ratio, or anything like that about the people who were buried at Holstadt, because we only have one skeleton left. But if that's not bad enough, archaeologists love pottery. We love pottery because pottery is made in very distinctive styles and shapes. Each particular science society has its own particular tradition in pottery making. Uh, we can date pottery very accurately because pottery can be dated from archaeological sites. But a piece of pottery, easy to break, but the pieces will never be destroyed unless buried in acid. So broken pieces of pottery are really our best dating uh, evidence. Well, what did von Sacken do of the 1,244 pottery vessels he found at Holstadt? All of them were basically thrown away except for 40. Well, that apart, von Sacken did at least realize the importance of the site, that it did represent this transitional period uh, from the uh, Bronze Age to the, to the Iron Age. He also realized the importance of this site in the sense of helping understand archaeology throughout the rest of Europe. And so in 1848, he authorized the first publication of uh, one of the books about Holstadt, and then a second report appeared in 1857. These two reports focused on the number and the quality of the Bronze Age and the Iron Age graves at Holstadt. These reports emphasize that these were the richest graves of those periods that were known in the whole of Europe. 
These reports emphasized that what this indicated was that the people living at Holstadt almost certainly had made a fortune from mining the white gold. There were, of course, questions. Well, some of those graves had such elaborate weapons and jewelry in them. Did they actually represent local people? Or did they represent people who'd come, local chiefs who'd come to the site to be buried for one reason or another? Well, the answer to that wasn't to come for another 100 years or so. But a more important thing about these two publications was that knowledge of the whole stamp material now became spread throughout Europe. Knowledge that the whole stamp material must all date to before about 400 BC, but beginning, the graves must begin at roughly the beginning of the, um, the end of the Bronze Age. Warsoy and other people start to analyze all this material. They go to Vienna, they make careful measurements of everything they see, they look at what's being found in Holstadt. Because the same type of finds being made at Holstadt had already been made in Germany, in Switzerland, Denmark, Norway, even in England. Warsaw and others realized that if they could work out the date of this material, then they could actually start putting fixed points on the Iron Age and the end of the Bronze Age. Well, the method that Warsaw and the others used to get this kind of fist system was something that he'd already done when looking at the material from the Stone Age. He'd looked at differences in the way stone tools were made, from the simplest to the more complicated. He worked out from this that there were three major phases. It's a process we know as seriation typology. Well, what is seriation typology? It's such an obvious thing in many ways. Seriation typology is a method of placing objects of the same type into a chronological sequence according to changes in style, material, and decoration. This slide illustrates exactly the process. You can all see immediately that, well, this is a, a 1970s Citroën actually down here. I haven't updated it to bring it into the 21st century. But you can see how the method of wheel transport has changed from a simple carriage to the earliest type of motor car. And suddenly, one day, somebody has a brilliant idea. Why don't we put a roof on it? Next stage in the development. We come to the 1940s, we get to this type of thing, and then the 1970s, the Citroën down there. I could tell you a joke about Henry Ford there. The reason why so many countries don't drive on the right side of the road, which in England is the left-hand side of the road, not the right-hand side of the road. And it's all to do with the fact that in the earliest motor car, just like the earliest wheel transport, the handbrake was on the side, right side, because the driver had the right hand to pull it to stop a vehicle from going anywhere. But then Henry Ford came up with a lovely idea. Oh, I can put it in the middle of the car like that. Oh, if it's in the middle of the car, You'd have to use your left hand, unless we put the driver's seat on the other side. So there you are. And don't forget that until the 1960s in Sweden, they still used to drive on the, uh, what I call the right side of the road, the left side of the road. Many countries still do, including Japan. And I told you at the beginning of this course, you would get a lot of totally useless information. Well, there you are. So anyway, seriation typology. It's a method of putting things in order. And it's possible to see changes in style, changes in material over periods of time. I can illustrate it better by looking at it like this. The Coca-Cola bottle. The earliest Coca-Cola bottles, straight-sided, nothing distinctive about them. They develop a different type of... Uh, the first one has got a cork in it, then they put a different type of cork in it. Then somebody invites what we call a crown cap. So the style of the bottle changes. But fashion plays its part as well. So the style of the bottle 
starts to get a bit more of a curve until eventually, by 1956, you've got the type of coca-cola bottle that you can recognize today. Now, there are slight differences in all of these, but you can see the changes. This method of seriation typology involves assuming that these changes in shape and decoration will take place on a fairly regular basis. 50 years, possibly even longer. With jewellery, it's much quicker. But something that's functional like a weapon, probably much longer. And so what Warsoy and the other people eventually came up with was, here's another typology for you, one you probably won't understand, the Coke can. The original Coke can, it had to be opened with a separate fastener. Then they came up with the disposable pool tab. But too many people kept on putting these back inside the can while drinking, and then they, <laughs> then they would die. So that's why we end up with the pushing can. But anyway, that's seriation typology. The Warsaw and other antiquarians came up with basically a development sequence of sword types from the latest Bronze Age, the bronze swords at Holstadt, to about 400 BC, the end of the Holstadt Cemetery, with its characteristic hat-type terminal there. They calculated, they guessed, that these changes probably took place over a period of 400 years. The end date for Holstadt Cemetery is 400, so the start date for the Holstadt Cemetery, the end of the Bronze Age, in other words, must have been roughly about 800 or so BC. Well, this discovery took a long time in the making, or rather the, this process took a long time in the making. And it wasn't until uh, we get to 1874 that we have a major international conference in Austria and the Swedish archaeologist, Hans Hildebrand, comes up with the formal announcement, if you like, of the discovery of what we call the Hallstatt culture. We call it the Hallstatt culture because iron swords and bronze objects made in the same style as those found at Hallstatt are found throughout Europe. Archaeologists use the word culture in a very different way from what you might expect. If we can identify a group of objects that share the same style, that are very similar, then we assume that these represent a people who are somehow connected. They're sharing the same kind of social system, the share, or the same kind of social behavior. Well, in a sense, most students in Bill Kent belong to the gene culture. Most students in Bill Kent wear jeans. Right? So it's that type of analysis. So you can see groups of people using the same thing, dressing the same sort of, sort of way. We can call it a culture in that way. As for Ramsauer, everybody forgot about him. Von Sanken made all the publications. Warsaw and others did all the research on the typology. And poor Ramsauer was basically forgotten about. And it was only in the last 10 years or so that they actually put up a statue to commemorate him at Holstadt himself. The most famous person of Holstadt in many ways. He never got any recognition for his work while he was alive. He got no credit for his work while he was alive. And all the beautiful watercolour drawings he did of the 993 graves and the 6,000 objects have never been published. They just sit in the records room in Vienna. Well, by 1874, though, archaeologists in Europe had begun to get fixed dates, approximate fixed dates for the Iron Age. You couldn't say that this particular sword came into fashion in 600 BC, but you could say sometime between about 650, 550 BC, they must have developed this type of sword. But the, the Bronze Age must have ended around about 800 BC or, or thereabouts. And this, of course, was the only way that archaeologists could date sites from the Bronze Age and Iron Age until the development of radiocarbon dating in 1949. So this is a significant discovery, Holstadt. It gave archaeologists the key 
to give a chronology to the Iron Age. There was only one problem, though. Nobody knew what happened after 400 BC. And it just so happened that a few, a few years after uh, the declaration that, of the Hallstatt culture, the scholars began to hear about a series of discoveries that had been made in Switzerland at a place called Laten. The village of Laten lies on the side of Lake Neuchatel. And in 1857, there had been a very dry summer, the level of the lake dropped by two metres. Some of the workmen went around the site and they started to find pieces of wood sticking up from the, uh, below the water level and at least 40 iron swords. Well, these were given to a local collector who didn't tell anybody about them and none of them were seen until 1868 when Ferdinand Keller, an antiquarian, saw them. He immediately realised that these swords were of a completely different type from the ones found at Holstadt. They didn't have the little hat on the top. They had something else that looked like the figure of a man. That's why we call them anthropomorphic swords. So Keller realised that these must represent the weapons of the latest Iron Age. So they had to fit in after the Holstadt period, which ended roughly about 400 BC, but they had to fit in before the Romans arrived in what is now Switzerland in about 15 BC. Graves had been found with these types of weapons throughout Europe, including Britain. Nobody could actually put a date on them. What Keller realised was that this site, the Latin site, was going to give that much needed chronology or typology that would go on from the end of the Holstadt period down to uh, the Roman period. In 1880, the level of the lake was deliberately lowered and the opportunity came up to actually excavate on the site and the archaeologists found the remains of wooden buildings and wooden bridges and altogether in five years work they found 2,500 objects uh, another 166 swords, some of which have been deliberately bent. Well, this is a typical Latin anthropomorphic sword, uh, made of iron but with bronze decoration. But what they were finding were broken swords like this, large neck rings of a type that we call torques, bits and pieces of Worked bronze that clearly came from helmets or bowls. Some bronze axes as well, not too many, but a few of those. And the realisation that this site would fit the period that came after Holstadt, going down to the Roman period. Through the process of typology, this meant that archaeologists could now start to give dates to the latest Iron Age. Everything found at Latin had to fit in between about 400 BC and the Roman period. And again, through the same process of seriation typology, people were able to work out a rough chronology, a series of dates for the latest part of the Iron Age. The site at Latin, lots of people argued about what it was. Uh, the fact that many of the weapons that were found there had never been used before they were deliberately broken or bent, suggest that it's probably a ritual site. What is a ritual site? Well, we give the term ritual to any series of actions that are, are repeated for one purpose or another. So, for example, some footballers have a ritual of always putting the left sock on first and the right boot first, you know, that type of thing. It's a ritual. We often tend to think of ritual in terms of religion. The two are connected. When archaeologists can recognize a pattern of behavior, but we don't know what it represents, we call it ritual. It's a quick escape card, if you like, for a site. The probability is that Latin is a ritual site involving the deliberate burial or deliberate throwing into what must have been a lake of 
a wide range of objects. Now, all of the objects found in the Latin, uh, in the late Neuchatel, at Latin, are of local Iron Age type. It could represent the, what happened after a battle, when the defeated, the weapons of the defeated people were collected and thrown into the lake. We know that this happens in the late Iron Age in Norway. We find lots of Roman swords in lakes in, uh, in Norway after they've had, um, or Denmark rather, after uh, some action against the Romans. So what the Latin site exactly is is something we don't actually know. But the key point is the recognition of this group of objects from Latin, 2,500 objects, many of them decorated, again with great similarities with material found throughout the rest of Europe, meant that archaeologists could again start to put a series of fixed dates down on the later Iron Age. This really was a major development. Thompson had started work on his three-age system in 1816. Came up with the idea pretty quick, didn't actually publish it until the 1830s, but people knew about the three-age system. Warsoy had managed to get a relative chronology for the Stone Age, based on typology, but also on excavation. We come up with, thanks to Lubbock, the, the terms uh, Paleolithic, Mesolithic, and Neolithic. Holstadt gives the chance to have fixed dates for this period, for the Iron Age at least. Holstadt has to fit in between the Bronze Age and 400 BC. There is nothing at Holstadt that can be dated later than 400 BC. That's known of from work elsewhere uh, in Europe. So archaeologists now actually had the chance to, when they excavated the site, at least be able to say, well, this is approximately 4th century BC, or it's 6th century BC, or it's 8th century BC. Holstadt and Latin are actually making history from the study of artefacts. Surprisingly enough, even though we've got very sophisticated dating methods now, the dates that these scholars came up with are more or less pretty accurate. But they just worked this out on this basis of changes in fashion happen over a certain period of time. Well, the site at Latin, we still don't properly understand. It's some kind of ritual site. But as for Holstadt, we still don't understand why the Holstadt salt mains stopped being worked about 400 BC. But what is clear from excavations there is that the graves found at Holstadt are actually the graves of people who lived at Holstadt. Because excavations have revealed evidence for animal bones and fish bones, indicating that not only did they make their money from salt, trading salt, but they salted meat and fish at the site as well for export. So little Holstadt, not even a road going, well, no road going there until 1875, was, without any doubt, the most important trade centre in the whole of Europe for a period of 400 years, 800 BC going down to 400. Okay, I'm going to stop there.